that was it was Derek Jang Tichun doubled uh, for the crash through the the window onto the stairs, and he got injured. Uh, Derek Jung was, uh, is a good friend of mine, and uh, he came from a wushu background, actually. Very good spatial awareness, lovely guy, very good with weapons, but that that stunt put him out of action for quite a long time. You know, he said his stomach swelled up and filled with blood. It's a nasty stunt. I mean, we still look at those stunts in awe, but I'm... B because of the ballsiness of the stunt people, but I'm more impressed by the ones where the person hits the deck, it looks really painful, and then they get up afterwards. And sure, you're going to have the wind knocked out of you. That's expected. That's okay. But if you're able to do it and be able to do a second take, that's really important. And I've heard people say, you've probably heard people say, the difference between a daredevil and a stunt performer is a stunt performer can do it twice. This is an interview with Jude Poyer. Jude is a stuntman and action designer who got his start in Hong Kong on films like A Man Called Hero and recently designed action for Gangs of London. Jude talks about his journey as a Hong Kong stuntman, transitioning into working as a stuntman in the UK, and is working alongside Gareth Evans. So uh, tell us about your upbringing, where you're from, and what you were watching as a kid. Um... I'm from London. I was born in London, uh, raised in London until the age of seven. And I would say I'm from the VHS generation. You know, my parents were sort of early adopters. We had a big, huge, clunky VHS machine. So uh, I grew up with James Bond, Indiana Jones, Jaws, Star Wars. So I grew up loving movies. Uh, my dad was also into his music. And uh, one movie that he exposed me to, which I didn't realize until quite recently had a huge impact on me, was the Ken Russell rock opera Tommy with The Who. And uh, it's probably not a film you should show to a kid of about five or six because it deals with trauma, abuse, religion, celebrity culture. But I think that the images in that film are so strong um, and it is, it's a musical. There's no dialogue per se. Uh, I think that film showed me what could be achieved in cinema with camera, with editing, with visuals, you know, that visual medium. So um, definitely, you know, the action of Bond and Indiana Jones, but then movies like uh, Tommy had a huge influence. Then when I was seven, uh, my father got a job in Sri Lanka. So my parents moved there and I was put into boarding school in the UK, which I think is quite a young age, but probably down the line gave me that sense of independence that stood me in good stead when I went to Hong Kong. And when I was at boarding school, uh, there was a teacher, uh, Martin Summers, a PE teacher, and he would teach judo once a week. So I started learning judo from him. And he was also a film buff. And occasionally, if there was like a rainy Sunday afternoon, he'd put a movie on. And he was showing us kids between the age of seven and 13 police story and young master and Chuck Norris movies. Or he showed a Shokasugi movie once. So he had a huge impact on me. Um, I'll backtrack a little bit in tandem with that. Uh, in the holidays in Sri Lanka, at the time there was a civil war going on. So it was, you had to be care fairly careful about going out and certainly you wouldn't just send your children out into the streets. So uh, we uh, we would rent a lot of movies and we went to a video store and my brother said, I want to rent a martial arts film. And I had no idea what a martial art, what martial art meant. And he rented Ninja 3, The Domination. And that was the first martial arts film I saw. And that that was definitely a light bulb moment for me. And then it was, we want to study martial arts. So we started uh, training in Shotokan Karate. So holidays included watching a lot of movies, uh, Bruce Lee, a lot of bad ninja films, and uh, and then going back to school uh, and training in karate, and then going back to school, I had this PE teacher who was a movie buff, and he did something that really did change my life when I look back on it, is in 1990, Channel 4 screened a 45-minute uh, documentary where Jonathan Ross went to Hong Kong and profiled Jackie Chan and 
nowadays that probably doesn't sound like much, but Jackie Chan was never on British television. And uh, Mr. Summers uh, said, give me a blank VHS and I'll copy you that show. And on the half term holiday, I took the term, uh, the tape back uh, and I watched it. And I'd already seen Young Master and Police Story at that time. I'd read about Jackie Chan in, uh, in Combat Magazine. But uh, my eyes were open to the world of Hong Kong action and Hong Kong stunts because this show really focused on the stunt work. Uh, I would have been 12 years old at the time. And then I just knew that was something I needed to look into more. Uh, there was a Jackie Chan fan club, which I read about in Combat Magazine. I got in touch with them. They became Eastern heroes. And through the Jackie Chan fan club, I discovered the films of Yun Biu, Sammo Hung, John Woo, and then, then later on Jet Li and a lot of other Hong Kong filmmakers. So in my teenage years, I was continuing to train in martial arts and uh, just consuming a lot of Hong Kong cinema and then cinema beyond, uh, you know, certain Japanese filmmakers like Takashi Kitano. Uh, he's one of my favorite directors. Um, going back to my dad and, and the boarding school days, you know, one thing he did, which uh, I don't think he realized how great he realized how grateful I was, but we had a full size VHS camera, or rather he did. And occasionally he would use it to to dub tapes. And we came back for the holidays and he very kindly rented a couple of martial art films and, and copied them for us to watch when we arrived. And one of them was a very bad Carter Wong movie, but the other one was Shogun Assassin. I'm sure he didn't watch it. <laughs> so I was like eight, nine years old being exposed to Shogun Assassin. Um, so I'm grateful to him for that. When you were taking Shotokan, uh, did you have it in your mind that you were taking martial arts for film? Not at that stage. I mean, I was very young. Uh, it was before I thought about pursuing a career in the industry. I think I was probably 13 when I thought this is something I'd like to do. The reason why we did Shotokan was because that was what was available. And also this was Sri Lanka. So there wasn't a lot of different martial arts around. And you know, uh, a lot of people, they they piss on. Can I swear on this podcast? A lot yeah, of people, I'll, I'll mute some of it. Depends. Okay. You know, go ahead. Do whatever you want. Pe people can shit on Shotokan as a style. As a fighting style, of course, it needs to be adapted. But I would say that's the case with a lot of classical styles. And if you look at the way people drill Shotokan, it doesn't look practical. But then I would say watch some fighters, specifically Japanese fighters or Brazilian fighters with a Shotokan base or a karate base, they make it work. But for me, I wasn't, you know, thinking about movies. I was enjoying the art. I was enjoying the discipline, the movement. I'm not somebody who's gifted athletically. I'm not a nat natural athlete, um, but I had some flexibility and uh, it was nice, I guess, for a small kid to be kind of mimicking the moves that he was seeing Bruce Lee do. And of course, then, you know, you do things outside the curriculum. You buy yourself a pair of nunchucks and you hit yourself on the head and that kind of thing. Yeah. So so but at a certain point, you you did start catering your training towards sort of your inspirations that you were that you were watching. But did you have your eyes on actually doing stunts? When when I when I was at school, uh, I used to take part in school plays and I enjoyed acting. And I remember being in a class uh, in school, I think it was a French lesson or something at the in the final term. And the teacher asked, oh, what do you want to be when, you know, as a career? And I answered an actor because I thought, yeah, that's something I'd like to do. Um, I'm happy to say I realized after a few years working that I'm not actually that good an actor and being a professional actor probably wasn't the right path for me. But when I went to my high school, I was still thinking about I want to work in the film industry. I want to perform and um, still training my martial arts. And I was watching all these Hong Kong movies and I was seeing a lot of faces that, of course, you know the names, the Cynthia Rothrocks, the Jeff Falcons, the Mark Houghtons, Bruce Fontaine. I was seeing these white people working in Hong Kong movies, having a career and uh, having great fight sequences. I didn't think I was as good as them, but I was also seeing people in Hong Kong movies from the West who were terrible. And I had this mentality, and I think I still have it now in my career, is I may not be anywhere near the best, but I'm definitely not the worst, so I should give it a shot. Uh, I didn't realize that 
a lot of the times when you watched Hong Kong movies, especially the low budget ones, and you saw Western people fighting and not being very good, they weren't people that wanted to be action actors. They were backpackers that were making their way through Asia, staying in a dormitory. And then one day someone comes around and says, hey, you want to be in a movie? You earn 50 bucks. And they go, yeah. And then they get to set and they get told, right, you're going to do this. But I didn't know that. Ignorance is bliss, you know, and that arrogance of youth of thinking, oh, I can do that. I can do the splits. I can kick. So, um, so yeah, going through school, I was like, yeah, I want to work in the film industry. I knew some people that were professional actors who were very talented and trained and they were struggling financially. They weren't getting lots of work. I knew some stunt people and they weren't working too much. So for me, it kind of made sense. Why pursue acting or why pursue a career in the British film industry? And then when I was coming to the end of school, or the, the logical step is to go into higher education. And uh, I remember I found one university that was teaching a film and drama degree. And I thought, film and drama, that's that's got me written all over it. And I, I went to the interview and I went to the open day. And I remember some of the uh, first year students were showing us, uh, some, of the, some of the first year students were showing us potential uh, inductees around. And uh, there was an editing bay and there were some 16 millimeter cameras. And I said to the student, oh, you, you're shooting with 16 millimeter. And, and they said, oh, no, no, really, the, that's more for the second year. And I realized that this person wasn't really interested in filmmaking, or at least not to the degree that I wanted to, because at school I was grabbing uh, VHSC cameras and shooting little documentaries about the school and then editing them on two VHS decks. So that kind of put me off. So I was offered a place at the university, but in my head, I thought, okay, it's very normal in the UK. I don't know about in the States to take a gap year between high school and going into university or college. Um, so I just thought, why not go to Hong Kong? What's there to lose? And then if it doesn't work out, I can come back and I can carry on in education. But I thought, why not try to learn about filmmaking on film sets, working with the people that are the best at what they do. So I thought I'd give it a go. So when I was 18 years old, I got a one-way plane ticket to Hong Kong. What was the uh, what was the attitude at the university toward action filmmaking? That I don't know, because I only spent a day there, but I oh. remember one of the tasks, because it was just an interview, uh, oh. but I remember one of the tasks we were given was to you know, okay, write a breakdown about a, an analysis of a scene in a film. And I wrote about uh, one of the montage scenes in Sonatine. And I have no idea whether they'd seen that film, but it was a film that spoke to me. Um, uh, yeah, in, in the British film industry, and that extends towards the sort of academic side of things, that I think there's still very much a snobbery towards action. We see progression outside i think in obviously in asia and uh in america we're seeing a lot of directors from stunt backgrounds but in britain there's still quite a bit of snobbery towards action i think where do you think that comes from um i'm not sure where it comes from but i think britain can be a very elitist kind of place and uh, you just have to look at the kind of people that rise to power in, in politics. They tend to have gone to a certain number of schools or universities, not all of them, but a disproportionate amount. And if you look at a lot of the, the high profile actors in the UK, a lot of them have the same educational backgrounds. And maybe it's similar to that argument about why isn't there an Oscar for the stunts? I think some people don't like to give credit where it's due and they don't want to acknowledge things for what it is because you or I see action as an art form. Whereas people who want to will say, oh, that's half naked Chinese guys, you know, slapping each other, you know, or it's just uh, cartoon violence. I think the attitude's slightly changing because people of my generation are now moving into positions of power in the film industry or positions of influence in film criticism. And they talk about filmmakers like John Woo with great reverence. But in the UK, there was very much a, 
well, I grew up in an era like when I was growing up, the Bruce Lee movies on VHS were heavily censored. You did not catch sight of nunchaku. They were all cut. Ninja movies, shurikens were removed. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon, uh, when it showed on the BBC Children's Hour or wherever it was, um, it was retitled Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. And there was no sign of the nunchaku and all the toys were rebranded. I don't know if you know this, but for the UK, the Golden Harvest uh, Ninja Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, they had to reshoot certain, well, not reshoot, but they would shoot certain shots to be marketable for the UK. So like you'd see a turtle on the phone talking to the pizza delivery guy and he's swinging his nunchaku. They get that take and then they'd shoot, okay, now we shoot the UK version because it would have been too much of a, censorship exercise to remove every shot so they would uh, you know so that was the culture i grew up in where there was a bit of a stigma towards martial arts mm. and towards action what well, but that which is strange because isn't isn't there a, a long history of sword fighting and plays and th were those ever censored or was that is that considered art and these other things are not not that i'm aware of but i think in in the uk there's not totally, but there's definitely a within a lot of people there is an island mentality, and there is a snobbishness and there's an otherness uh, towards other cultures. I think that's changing as the world becomes smaller and we get exposed to more people and more cultures. But um, it would extend not just to uh, action, you know. For instance, um, uh, a scene of animal cruelty, and I, I can't tolerate animal cruelty. I don't want to see it, but uh apocalypse now they would show a cow being slaughtered uncut and people would say but aren't the british board of film classification meant to remove scenes of animal cruelty and then the bbfc would say oh well it's because that wasn't staged particularly for the movie it was going to happen anyway and the cameras rolled which i'm not sure if that's true um they would censor movies which were dubbed in english or in english language much more stricter than if the film was a subtitled foreign language movie. And I think the attitude of the censors and by extension, the politicians was kind of like, it's okay for the middle-class uh, Chardonnay drinker to watch this stuff, they won't be affected. But what about the kid living on a housing estate? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's, I think things have changed a lot. Like for instance, censorship in the UK has loosened up a lot and people are much more aware of uh, action cinema and they appreciate it more but that that was very much part of the Britain that I grew up in hmm. so you decide to go to the the land of ninjas and uh nunchucks yourself uh what was that uh what was that journey like and how did it start uh I booked a plane ticket you know months in advance I think I got a one-way ticket just because that would make it harder for me to come home if it didn't work out. I'd saved up some money by working in a martial arts store on the weekends. And back then, this was pre, uh, pre showreel days. I had this portfolio of photos of like me kicking and with my shirt off and all of this that I would carry around with me. Um, but I went there not knowing a lot of people, but just, in preparation for this conversation, I, I had a chance to reflect on certain things that have happened in my life, which you could call them coincidences, or maybe they weren't coincidences, but they had a big impact on me. The PE teacher was one of them. Uh, there was another uh, relationship which has survived to this day, which I knew uh, through Eastern Heroes. Eastern Heroes had a little shop in Camden Town selling VHS tapes and memorabilia. And there was a guy there who was a big Hong Kong movie fan who sold drugs. And um, somebody that he sold drugs to was producing a video game. This was in 1995. And they were talking about the project, probably while smoking a joint. And I get a phone call saying, oh, Jude, uh, we need to talk. And I thought, oh, what's this? And he basically said, oh, a mate of mine's uh, making a video game. It's got some martial arts in it. They want to see you. 
So I went and met them and I got a role in this video game, which was for Philips, which never got released. The technology was ahead of its time. Essentially, it was pre-Matrix bullet cam where we were filming in the Camden Roundhouse, which is now a venue for concerts. But at the time, it, it used to be once upon a time, a place where the trains got turned around. So it was this round building and they built a 360 degree blue screen with a blue treadmill and a platform in the middle. And they had lipstick cameras getting a 360 degree view. So it was it was groundbreaking technology. So I worked on that video game. I'm sorry, this is a long story, but, but it had an impact on my life. Um, when we did the rehearsal day, I met some of the other actors. And one of them was a guy who uh, was not a professional performer. He was some, a martial artist uh, called Chris Webb. And the way Chris had ended up on the video game was he lived in Southampton, which is a couple of hours from London. And I think he was working as a physical trainer. And he was friendly uh, with a guy at a Chinese takeaway called Hong Ping Tang. Now, Hong Ping was this big, bald, muscular Chinese guy with no desire to be an actor. But because of how he looked, Hong Ping got approached by agencies and started to get extra work and then acting work. Now, Hong Ping is quite a prolific actor. He's been in Warrior. He's been in Into the Badlands. So it's funny how his career has gone. So anyway, Chris went into the takeaway and Hong Ping was like, Chris, I've got a casting for a video game and I need to fight. Can you help me out? And Chris said, yeah, sure, I'll show you some things. And Chris took a road trip with him up to London, did a casting as well when he was there and got cast in the video game. Uh, that was in 1995. To this day, Chris is still my best friend and he's like my right-hand man when it comes to choreography. So a lot of the stuff you see in Gangs of London, uh, final score, it comes from Chris and I putting our heads together. Um, I don't know where I started with this, uh, how I ended up with this story, but okay, that was one uh, weird relationship. Another one was as a teenager, I would often go up to Chinatown and look for Hong Kong movie memorabilia and there was Cinemart magazine. So pre-internet days, this was how you found out what Jet Li movie was coming. And there was a new store opened in Chinatown, just like a knickknack store. And I walked in and, you know, they would often sell photos of like movie and uh, teen idols. And I said, oh, have you got any photos of Chow Yun Fat? And the, the man, the proprietor said, oh, why do you want photos of that old man? You might as well have photos of me. And we started talking. And it turned out that his son uh, was an actor in Hong Kong. Uh, his name is Carl Wong Ziyang. Now, Wong Ziyang, you've seen in Once Upon a Time in China and a whole bunch of gangster movies. So I became friends with this man. He was like a godfather figure to me. I met his son a couple of times. And then one day, you know, occasionally Jimmy would come back from Hong Kong and he'd have some VHS tapes with him. And he had a tape of a, a movie that his son had recently done. And it was a film called No Regret, No Return, directed by Ridley Cho. And I watched that and I saw the stunts in that. And I'm not somebody who normally would be like, hey, introduce me to so-and-so. I don't like to put that pressure on people. And I said, please, when I go to Hong Kong, introduce me to Ridley Cho. So Carl did that. Uh, he was away when I first got to Hong Kong, but eventually he did that. That's how I got to know Ridley. That's how I eventually got into the Stuntman Association. Um, but when I first arrived in Hong Kong, I think my second day, I had some things to do, like open a bank account. And I'm this young kid, 18 years old, trying to look older, walking around the city. And I think I'd just been to the bank and I walked past this gym, which had just opened uh, California Fitness. It was like multi-level gym. And these guys were outside trying to sell memberships. And they they'd start to try and chat me up and sell me a membership. Oh, why are you in Hong Kong? And I said, oh, I've come here because I want to do martial art movies. Uh, I want to be an actor. And one of them said, oh, one of our guys, one of our trainers, Jack, he does movies uh give me your details and then that afternoon i went back to the, the gym and i met this chinese american guy called jack lamb and uh he we talked and then he said i'm going to give you the details of my agent and i think the following day i went to his uh agent's office and uh, this agency represented most of the fighting foreigners in hong kong wow so uh so what was your first gig at that point I'm trying to think, I think the I, I got a couple of commercials, not particularly martial art based. I think one of them had a little bit of sword twirling, but it was more that I was a young white guy 
and uh, you know I wasn't afraid to act a bit. But the first action role I had was in Downtown Torpedoes, and I think that agent had put me forward for it, and then it went quiet. But then another guy called Steve Brettingham, who used to do a lot of IFD movies, he called me up and said, "Oh, they want a few of us guys for this uh, movie." I knew nothing. I went down, we were filming on a location and I realized straight away, oh, it's a Golden Harvest movie. Wow, I'm in a Golden Harvest film, you know? And still there's a part of me that's still like, if none of this works out as a career, the Hong Kong fanboy got to work on a Golden Harvest movie, you know? And then I looked and I saw Stephen Dong Wai and I said, do you know who that is? And none of the other Westerners knew. I said, that's Dong Wai from, you know, Enter the Dragon and Incredible Kung Fu Master. Um, So that was the first gig. I didn't have much to do in that. We did some shooting in Golden Harvest Studios, which again was a nice tick of the box for me as a fanboy. Um, The first day on set, I saw an accident. I didn't witness many accidents in Hong Kong. And I think a lot of people still have this mentality that Hong Kong stunt people will crash and burn and would just do insane things. And of course it looks insane. Ridley Choi once said to me, your skill is your safety. And I think that's very, very true because while they would put safety measures in, most of the Hong Kong stunt people, and I don't include myself in them, I think I'm probably the worst stunt person to ever work in Hong Kong, but most of those guys, their skill was at such an insane level that it was their body control, their spatial awareness that kept them safe. But anyway, I digress. Takashi Kaneshiro and, and Jordan Chan are on a motorbike and they're meant to ride it into the into the harbor. And they had a stunt double with a dummy on his back do it. And we were playing agents and we were on a ship. And uh, I remember one of the extras said to me, oh, why do they need a stunt man to do that? And I said, well, you know, if he hits the water too hard, he could bang his head on the handlebars. If his clothes get caught in the motorbike and it starts to sink, he's going to be in trouble. The take happened. It's in the movie. The bike hit the water really hard. And I think the rider must have bashed his head on the handlebars. He stayed face down in the water. And Dong Wai is screaming in it. And a boat goes out to him, a speedboat. And they got to the guy and they turned him over. And he just started like projectile vomiting. It was like something out of The Exorcist. Because he'd taken in a load of the Hong Kong harbor water. So that was pretty sobering my first day on a Hong Kong action movie and I saw an accident like that. But I have to say, I didn't witness anything like that. Uh, So you didn't go back. So you didn't go buy your return ticket after that? (laughs) No, but I think I went home and I cried because I, it was, it was tough to see that happen to somebody. And probably there was a bit of self pity as well involved. Like, what am I getting myself into? Well, I mean, Describe what it's like. And and this is, what year is this, 98? That was 97. I went there end of 96. And uh, Downtown Torpedoes shot the beginning of 97. So what was it like for you then um, going on set? um, Did people look at you funny? Did you speak the language? What was the reaction to Aguilo coming on? I understood. I understood quite a bit of Cantonese from watching movies, from hanging out with Chinese friends and in Chinatown. And I'd uh, used a tape course before I went. So I understood a basic amount and I wasn't afraid to try and speak. So I didn't speak it well, but I think people appreciate when you make the effort. And I think even though I wasn't a great martial artist, people could tell okay, this is somebody that's come here who wants to do our movies, who has a level of understanding of what we're trying to do, as opposed to a martial artist that's in Hong Kong and thinks, oh, I'll just give it a go. Um, I found most Hong Kong stunt people to be very friendly, very accommodating, very warm, not macho types, very forgiving in terms of your shortcomings. There's a certain degree of impatience on a Hong Kong film set where if you can't do it, they'll swap you out for a double. Um, at the time, uh, when that happens to you, it can be very sobering. But now as a, a second unit director myself, I completely get it. And I've I've done it. And I just say, I'm sorry, put the costume on Brian. He's going to do it because we just don't have the time. Um, 
but yeah, I, I I have a lot of had a lot of very positive experiences even in those early productions. Like I remember my agent called me and said, "Oh, Jean Claude Van Damme's making a movie. They they want to do a casting." And I remember thinking, "They're going to want guys that are six foot tall and you know, hench. That's not me." And it turned out the movie was knockoff, and they needed a lot of guys, and they didn't all need to be massive bodybuilders because they needed Russian mafia people. And, you know, Samo was second unit directing and Bing was action coordinating. And then there were all these faces that I recognized. I mean, by that time, I hadn't met some Hong Kong stunt people. But, you know, you're on set and it's like, oh, that's Mars. Oh, that's Benny Lai doubling Rob Schneider, you know. And I think Knockoff was also positive because at the same time as Knockoff was being shot, there was the Hong Kong handover. And as part of the celebrations for the Hong Kong handover, there was a big show at the Hong Kong Coliseum. And part of that show was like a little bit of action performed by the Hong Kong Stuntmen's Association, where it was like Fist of Fury. A bunch of us karate guys came out, did a, like a bit of a kata, and then Donnie Yen appeared as Chun Chun and beat us all up. But it meant that I was spending time with a lot of Hong Kong stunt people rehearsing that, rehearsing that, rehearsing that, performing that. So some it wasn't unusual to go from rehearsing with a stunt person one day and then being on set with them on knockoff the next. Was it kind of surreal for you going to Hong Kong and working on a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie and seeing Benny Lai doubling Rob Schneider? Totally, totally surreal. I mean, I'm still, I'm still a Hong Kong film fan. You know, I still geek out about uh, meeting certain filmmakers. I'm not somebody who tends to get starstruck because by now I've met a lot of famous people. And uh, in the West, often that, those can be very disappointing encounters, you know, where the artist doesn't match up, uh, the human doesn't match up to the artist that you see on the screen. But generally, the the talents in Hong Kong were much more humble, much more low key, and then they would turn out to be as nice as they were talented. You know, somebody like Yun Bu, for instance, there was a moment during A Man Called Hero, because when I cast for A Man Called Hero, uh, we did the casting myself and Thomas Hudak, who played my father. And uh, the assistant director said, oh, this movie is going to be made by the people that made Storm Riders. It's kind of like a follow up. And Storm Riders had left me cold. It didn't do anything for me. And then she said, and you, if you get the role, you get to fight Yun Bu. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and I really wanted it. And then Yun Bu turned out to be super humble, super cooperative. Um, there was a moment during the fight where he had to chain punch me. And it was uh, quite, th that fight was shot in Masters and not in a lot of time. So I wasn't always remembering the choreography. And I just said, please just make contact because that way I'm going to react. And he did. I mean, he wasn't going full bore and I was padded, but I was feeling these chain punches. And there was a little voice in my head saying, the prodigal son is he's chain punching you, <laughs> you know. And during that fight, there was a moment where Yun Bu jumps and does a roundhouse kick and he connected and he almost knocked me out. Probably my fault for being too close, because if I had to lay money on Yun Bu's control or a rookie stunt actor making a mistake, I'm going to put the money on the rookie stunt actor making it. But for the rest of the after, I mean, we carried on. I was fine. But Yimbu kept coming over and saying, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. And uh, that's surreal. One thing to work with your idols, I don't know if that's a good word, or your, your screen heroes, the people you emulate or look up to, but then to see that their work ethic and their humanity is uh, something to aspire to as well. It's, it's, it's a nice experience and it's a good lesson. Can you just talk about what the process for shooting the action was like? And I, I understand it's it's a little bit different, like you said, it was shot in Masters. Mm. Uh, but was the choreography done on the spot? Was it all the otherwise typical traits of a Hong Kong film shoot? Most of the Hong Kong films I did, uh, it was all montage, which I know you fully understand, which is you shoot specific shots for specific edits and you just overlap a move. And that's my preferred way to do action 90% of the time. Um, we didn't rehearse in Hong Kong. The only two times I rehearsed in Hong Kong in the eight years I was there was for an American movie and for an American TV commercial. Um, so 
choreography was made up on the spot or on the day. Of course, it's not 100% made up because if there are wire gags, that's had to have been thought of ahead of time. They have to work out where they're going to put the crane and what equipment's needed. But in terms of the physical choreography, it's blocked out on the spot, or at least you as a, a stunt actor or a stunt performer who's not part of the core team, you're learning it pretty much then and there. If it's on a shot by shot basis, that's not too bad because you either get it or you don't. And you see very quickly the performers who can get it. Because when you go to a casting in Hong Kong, quite typically you do a little solo routine, show what you can do, some kicks, some falls or whatever. If you can flip, you flip. And then two stunt performers will do a quick routine and then you go over it slowly twice with them and then it's your turn to do it fast and that's it. And that's how they kind of gauge, oh, this person gets it or they don't, you know? Uh, Man Called Hero was unusual because Andrew Lau, the director, uh, was formerly a DOP. I think he was the DOP of Man Called Hero as well. And he's just his way of shooting action wasn't what I would call the typical Hong Kong style. So the fight I did with Yun Bu, they wanted to shoot it from A to Z and then just the final wire gag at the end. And as it was, we did a bunch of takes where it fell apart, maybe two thirds in, and they went, okay, let's just pick it up halfway through. But I think that fight probably was shot in like three or four hours, which is not a lot of time by Hong Kong standards. But I think if you watch that movie, you can tell that the action isn't that precise, uh, motivated camera work style that we associate with Hong Kong cinema of that era. Did they... Um... Did they consider your skills when devising the choreography for you? I would think so, because, um, you know, for that movie, you know, I did a casting and again, similar thing. You you show like a repertoire of moves. You do a solo routine. And because I don't come from a forms background, I always used to find that a bit intimidating. I'd much rather have a partner. And then because there was no stunt people at that casting, Tom and I just partnered up and did a routine. And I think, you know, those people, Dion Lam, Dee Dee, they're so talented. They can kind of look at that and gauge what you can do. And I think uh, Dion came up to me in, on the day and said, oh, which leg are you better with? I was like, oh, I'm better with my right leg. Oh, OK. You know, um, but no. And then on other movies I was on, you know, the sometimes the uh, coordinator would say, oh, can you do this move? yeah with a wire oh okay don't worry we'll do something else oh yeah we'll give you a wire or i can't do that with my left but i can do this instead and they'd be like okay did you find choreographers to be generally that accommodating in hong kong i think so i mean i have to say that because i wasn't of the standard of like the jeff falcons or the mike lamberts i wasn't getting the one-on-one -on -one fights with the lead actors unless it was like a low budget movie and you understand this, when you've only got a finite amount of time, you've just got to make it work, you know? And then they will be accommodating or they've gauged what your strengths and weaknesses are and they're, they're choreographing to that because, I mean, for me, when I pre -vis, of course I have to think in mind the ability of the actors, but I'm also thinking I wanna put this on screen and I'm gonna get the right stunt person who can make that happen. You know, but if you're doing a Hong Kong, like Fist Power, for instance, the whole movie was shot in 13 days, you know, and there's a lot of action in there. So really, it's about what can we do to make this work? And the two uh, coordinators I worked with on that knew me quite well at that point, And they knew what I could do. And I think they played to my karate background and they knew that I wasn't super versatile, but I didn't mind to take a hit and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I think. Budget and time, uh, well, of course, they're related. They had a lot to do with it. So Fist Power, and it, there are some other, uh, you had also worked with um, Chu Men Chuk, Zhao Wen Zhou on uh, Black Sheep Affair. Um, was that also a, a quick shoot? Black Sheep Affair, I didn't work with Chu Men Chuk. He, he was the star of the movie. There was a scene in a prison wash washrooms like a, an attempted rape were on Andrew Lin, where he beats up all his attackers. I think that was like a two or three day shoot for a very short sequence. I don't think it was 
an additional photography shoot, but it was right at the end of the photography, quite close to the release date. So maybe the producers thought we need an extra fight here, or maybe it was already in their mind, but it was shot very quickly. Uh, Tony Cheng was, Cheng Su Dong was directing the sequence, um, but his assistant choreographer was a man called Joe Ma, Ma Yuk Seng. And I felt that Ma Yuk Seng really took the lead with the choreography for that. Um, Ma Yuk Seng, I think, is one of the great underappreciated Hong Kong action choreographers, partly because a lot of his work was in television and partly because he tended to do a lot of low budget work when it was when he was the sole choreographer. And maybe it was a rod that he created for his own back because from his TV background, he had a reputation of being extremely efficient and extremely fast. So he would do like movies for Wong Jing, which was shot in like 10 days. Of course, the action's not gonna be as good as a movie that was shot in three months, but Joe Ma knew where to put the camera, knew how to do choreography that wasn't gonna require 30 takes, but would be impactful. Um, I think a good example of Joe Ma's work would be the Korean movie, Bichin Mu, which is full of Cheng Siu Dong style wuxia action. And he had very little time to do that. And I think it holds up with uh, a lot of the Hong Kong movies of that period. Uh, and Joe Ma was somebody I worked with on Black Sheep Affair and then Fist Power. And Fist Power was directed by Aman Zheng who was a former editor uh, for Wong Jing. And Aman Zheng, kind of like how maybe you or I like to approach action, he would shoot his movies for the cut. And I remember after Fist Power, after a few months, he called me to work on another movie. And I think that movie was shot in like nine days. And then not long after that, I did a movie which he shot in seven days. I mean, these were features shot on 35 millimeter. And I remember him saying to me, do you know why I keep uh, hiring you? And I was like, not really. And he said, I remember, do you remember in Fist Power when you got kicked and you had to roll down the hill? There was like a retaining hill covered in concrete. He said, after the first take, you got up and you said, can I do it again? And for me, it was like, that's a no brainer. I want to do a better job. But I think he liked the fact that I might not be the best, but I want to do my best, you know? You did a you did a lot of Hong Kong films. I I figured I figured if you just want to talk about the ones that you want to talk about, mm -hmm. I'm I'm all ears. I'm just kind of nerding out. So no, you know I I got one a bunch of, on here. But. One of the one of the things that I did also when I was in Hong Kong was there was a British DVD label called Hong Kong Legends, and uh, this was in like the DVD boom when the market was really big. Uh, Hong Kong Legends were buying a lot of classic and not so classic Hong Kong movies and putting them out with loaded with special features. And they hired me to, to do some of those special features. And one of the things that was arranged was an interview with Ching Gala. And I think, I think Hong Kong legends like me because I would approach these interviews as a fan. So I would try and ask the questions that I thought the fans would find interesting and want to know, but also because I was inside the industry and I had an understanding of action filmmaking, I could keep a conversation going and, and get new bits of information that maybe a, a film critic or just a journalist wouldn't get. Uh, so interviewing Chingalok, that was the first time that I met him and it was a great conversation and he was lovely and he's a really nice man. And I remember at the end of it, I gave him a, my showreel on VHS. And then a few months later, I got a call to go for a casting and it was for a film that he was coordinating the action for called Star Runner. Um, on the strength of that VHS tape. And this was uh, not a great movie. It was a tournament movie. There was like a K1 style tournament. And what I'm getting at, uh, this is really a story just about Hong Kong film sets and the adaptability, but also sometimes the lack of ego that you get is, Ching Lok also played a character in that movie. He played a fighter. And Ching Lok had a stunt double and his stunt double for that movie was uh, Tony Mack, Mack Wai Zheng, who you probably know. Uh, he fought Donnie Yen in Legend of the Wolf. So you've got Ching Lok, one of the best stuntmen ever, who's doubled for everybody, Jackie Chan, Yun Biu. Ching Lok has a stunt double. And Monkey is, is doubling him. 
that also because it's a tournament movie and there are montages, Monkey played a fighter in one of the montages. And there was a shot where the camera was over Monkey's shoulder and he's taking these round kicks to, you know, he's taking them on the side. And he was getting pretty banged up. And Chingalok said, ah, Monkey, I'll double you. So Chingalok stepped in front of the camera <laughs> and doubled the guy who was stunt doubling him. And there was no ego about it. There was no, oh, I can do what you can't do, I, you know, and probably because Monkey wasn't really a fighter. He was a brilliant stuntman, but Chingalok had fought, so he probably had a different kind of conditioning. That's not the logic in my head. Chingalok was able to step in front of the camera, out to focus and take those kicks. And I remember he was watching the playback and he said, yeah, I do look a lot like Monkey. And it was just very relaxed and it was just that collaborative, whatever it takes to get it on celluloid, um, which I really, I really love because... You know, sometimes on a set in the UK, if you want to make like a last minute change to make something work, hair and makeup will throw a fit or, you know, the costume people will be like, oh, it's never going to work. You know, whereas there it was like trust Chingalok. He knows what he's doing and he's stepping into double monkey and monkey didn't get his ego wasn't bruised because he'd been doing crazy stunts for Chingalok earlier in the day. Chingalok kind of embodies that very dangerous Hong Kong aesthetic from the eighties. What was his, um, did he bring that to his action direction style? I think so. I mean, this was a very, uh, the stunts that took place were that when I was present, were all inside a ring. So obviously that's fairly limiting, but I remember when there was the montages and I was meant to do a little bit of fighting with another guy and, uh, you know, me and the stunt guy put together a very quick routine. And I remember Chingalok came over and said, that's good, but that's too movie for this. And he wanted it a little bit more, you know, gritty, a bit more visceral. And uh, I had a little fight with the lead actor who's using Wing Chun. And then at one point he does a leg sweep on me and it's made to drop me on the floor. And I'm, because I wanted to, because it felt right. I did a Tao Guan, you know, where you flat back on the ground. And I heard years later that he was really quite happy. And he actually said to one of his assistants, look, if a white guy can do that, you guys have no excuse. Which was which was really nice to hear. And I have to say that, you know, I've I bumped into him a few times uh, at TVB. We were both working on series at the same time and we were never close, but he would sit. He's a human being. He'd sit down, drink tea together, talk movies, talk action. Um he got me the job uh, on ultraviolet or at least he, I remember he called me up and he just said, Do you know who this is? And I was like, no, it's Chingalok. And of course, once again, the surreal fanboy is like, and he said, Oh, you know, my friend Paco Yik, he's been asked to find some uh, Western stunt people for this movie, you know? And that's nice because he's got nothing to gain by chucking a bone to somebody like me, you know, in this industry, there's a lot of times people will call you when they've got something to gain. Yeah. You got to imagine he probably went through some of that himself. Right. I mean, sure. you know, no. but I mean, in, in terms of as a, as a stunt performer, I mean, I was going to say to you, he was one of the best Hong Kong stuntmen, but that basically means he was one of the best stuntmen. Bar none in the and world. You, exactly. And you look at the work that he did. And of course, I think you need to have, you need to have ego and self-belief to push yourself to be that good. But that doesn't mean you need to be a dick. Sorry, I can't think of a better word. Yeah, you know, I, I, you meet you... some stunt people that are very, they believe their own hype. And, and it's like, no, you can be super talented and be a decent human being. They're not incompatible. Does he just have a high threshold of pain or is he just, is it just his skill? Was he walking with a limp? I mean, explain this guy. He's like a Terminator. I don't know. I mean, certainly he got a high threshold for pain because you look at the kind of body stunts he did. But, and I think he and his brother Chin Si Ho, they fought. Sin Lam Yok was one of their instructors. And I think there is, you know, you'll know this. There are some stunt people that have a martial arts competition background, i.e. fighting background, 
or they come from sports, contact sports like rugby, and they have a certain conditioning that it's not fair to expect of a stunt person that's only been a competitive gymnast or a wushu competitor. But Chingalok had that toughness, but then also ridiculous skill in terms of spatial awareness. And as you know, you can do a 360 spin through a table and just go for it and hope for the best. Or you can do it and know which part of your body is going to land and which is going to take the impact. And that's one way to avoid injuries. Um, so I think Chingalak had both of those. Was he uh, Was he the guy that did the header in Operation Scorpio doubling, no. doubling Kim Won-jin out of that? No, that was it was Derek Jang Tichin doubled uh, for the crash through the, the window onto the stairs and he got injured. Uh, Derek Jung was, uh, is a good friend of mine, and uh, he came from a wushu background, actually. Very good spatial awareness, lovely guy, very good with weapons, but that that stunt put him out of action for quite a long time. You know, he said his stomach swelled up and filled with blood. It's a nasty stunt. I mean, we still look at those stunts in awe, but I'm... B- because of the ballsiness of the stunt people, but I'm more impressed by the ones where the person hits the deck, it looks really painful, and then they get up afterwards. And sure, you're going to have the wind knocked out of you. That's expected. That's okay. But if you're able to do it and be able to do a second take, that's really important. And I've heard people say, you've probably heard people say, the difference between a daredevil and a stunt performer is a stunt performer can do it twice. Did uh did Ch- Chingalok talk about any of his past films, any stories that you can remember him telling you about? The things I remember most were um actually from doing the interview with him because I did a pretty long form interview for Hong Kong Legends, which I know they used it on the Operation Scorpio DVD, and I think they used part of it on the Eastern Condors DVD. And the one that really sticks out is in Eastern Condors, there was a shot where a Vietnamese boat gets blown up and some soldiers fall in the water and Ching Galak got engulfed in flame. Luckily, he went straight into the water, but he said when he came up to the surface, put his arms out for somebody to pull him back onto the boat, he said the skins came off his hands like ladies' gloves, like, you know, opera gloves. Yeah. That was something that Hong Kong was not known for at that period of time. It was physical stunts, you know, what I call body stunts, by far the best in the world. But when it came to working with pyrotechnics and things like that, it was a little bit more crash and burn. Sorry, that's a really bad pun. It was it was a bit more dangerous. And um, when I was in Hong Kong, Bruce Law was like, uh, I wouldn't say he was an outlier, but he wasn't, even though he had a martial arts background, he wasn't like part of the martial arts uh, Chinese opera heritage. He came from a vehicle background. And Bruce Law, I'm talking about in the late 90s, early 2000s, he most closely resembled an American stunt coordinator in that he had his facility in the New Territories. He had his workshop where he would build pipe ramps. He would import Nomex undergarments for fire stunts, fire gel, and that kind of thing. If you look at accidents that have happened on Hong Kong movies, a lot of the more famous ones have been related to pyrotechnics. Not Bruce Law, but, you know, Jade Lerm getting burnt, uh, Sibel Hu getting burnt. And these are accidents that with a little bit more technical know-how and a little bit more equipment could have been avoided. Um, I've done a lot of fire work in my career, but the first time I was on fire was on a man called Hero. And uh, there was an explosion and I did a wire pull, which when I look on it now, it looks a bit floaty, but that's Hong Kong movies for you. And Andrew Lau came up to me and said, okay, I want to have a bit of flame on you for when you land and when you get up. And I was like, okay. And I had no protection. I was wearing a leather jacket as part of my costume and leather's pretty fire resistant. And then they just put this uh, rubber cement and lit that and that caused the flames but there was no fire extinguisher. There was no bucket of water. Uh, 
no word of a lie, no exaggeration. What they used to extinguish me was an empty rice sack, a Hessian sack that had been wetted down. And initially they wanted me to fall to the floor with my back to the camera and with flame on my back and my arms, not a lot, roll onto my back and just put myself out. So the first take, land, roll, I'm doing this, doing this, and the flames aren't going out. So I start to turn and roll, which is, you know, what you know, what you're meant to do when you're on fire. And they were like, oh, get up, get up. And they put me out and they were like, why did you, um, why did you start rolling around? Why didn't you put yourself out? And I was thinking, well, the flames weren't going out and I don't really want to put my bare skin on rubber cement. <laughs> you know? But I didn't argue because, you know, you don't want to be the mouthy little kid you know who knows nothing which i was to a degree so we did the second take and that's the one in the movie and you can see i have my sleeves pulled up like this in anticipation and i was not putting those flames out and in the movie you will see i suddenly get to my feet it's because the crew could see the flames were getting big and they were like whoa as in get up get up so that's why i get up i get up to be extinguished because the flames were just getting out of control. And I, I've coordinated actors on fire. Lots of, it could be so safe if I was just wearing some Nomex or Carbonex undergarments and had a bit of fire protective gel around my face and on my hair, but I had nothing. And I had product in my hair, which of course can be highly inflammable. So when I was in Hong Kong, with the exception of Bruce Law, pyrotechnic stunts weren't uh, the safest the wild stunt uh it's a wild story i do want to talk about your your fire experience because that's i guess that's where your fire uh your fire stunt experience begins right there right yeah i've done i've done safety i've mean, witnessed a couple of fire i've witnessed a fire stunt in the uk before and i'd seen the uh, protocols that they go through which made me think okay this is some of course fire inherently is very dangerous and you can die doing a fire stunt, not just from burns to the skin, but if you inhale. But if you follow the protocols and you respect what you're doing and there's good communication on set, I think a, a fire stunt is a, is a good way to get a, a very impressive stunt that affects the audience because we all have an in, innate fear of flame and heat but it doesn't have to be particularly dangerous or particularly expensive. Why do you think it took Hong Kong so long to figure out fire stunt safety and other and other safety precautions? Were they and was Bruce Law borrowing that from America at the time? Kind of like how we were borrowing wires from Hong Kong at the time. Yeah, I think Bruce Law was. I think Bruce Law would make visits to California to pick up equipment and to gain knowledge. Uh, I'm kind of speculating here because I don't know what was in the mentality of the other filmmakers. Because often they would bring in Bruce, you'll see on a lot of Hong Kong movies of the era, they will say action director, Mayok Seng, fire stunt coordinator, Bruce Law, because they know, oh, this is the guy to execute it for us effectively and safely. But some Hong Kong producers are a little bit less concerned about safety or, you know, they're thinking about the costs involved and it's a bit more fly by the seat of your pants filmmaking, not so much on the big movies. I mean, look, Drunken Master 2, we see Jackie Chan ablaze and he's not wearing protective mask, but he's got Bruce Law on set to keep him safe, you know, and you can be sure that under his costume, he's wearing several layers of protection. Um, but, you know, this is a mentality I've seen, not just in Hong Kong, I've seen it in Spain, I've seen it in the UK, it was sometimes if people can make a good living doing things a certain way, they don't see a need to push themselves to improve or to change the way they do things. You work with, um, you work with Dong Wai quite a bit, uh, mm -hmm. you did Enter the Eagles as well. Did you have action in Enter the Eagles? Into the Eagles, I didn't do very much at all. I, I ran around with a gun and then I think they had some budget problems and they got a couple of uh, the background artists to double us 
for for our deaths. It was so, but for me, it, it was. I was happy to be on a movie, earning a bit of money, um, but also it's Corey Yoon, it's Yoon Dut, and I got to hang out with Benny the Jet Akitos, you know, and you know that's another one of those sort of surreal things is when you've got downtime on set and you're essentially getting paid to sit and have conversations with sensei benny okida and hear his stories of working on wheels on meals and knowing bruce lee and those kind of things but um i worked with cory in a couple of times subsequent to that there was a movie called so close where uh, i think i did a day's work it was a flashback which got reduced very much in the edit but um it was a nice day on set i think i had to turn up in one scene and harass uh one of the female characters fathers and then we come back to kill him and um I, I know, we come back to kill him and then we get killed and uh it was great just to be on set and by that time my cantonese was at a reasonable level that i knew what to ask for or you know I, maybe i can have a pad here and that kind of thing um, but also what I love to do is see Corey Yoon get in the thick of things because like a like a lot of Hong Kong action directors, there will be times where he will just take the camera and operate it himself to get what he needs. And uh, when I can get away with it, in the UK, it's not always easy. But uh, when I'm working abroad, I'll be like, oh, OK, I'll, I'll shoot this because I know what I want and it'll just be quicker if I operate camera. Um, and then... A couple of years after I moved back to the UK, I got a job on a film called Blood, The Last Vampire, which was shooting in China. And Corey Yun was the action director for that. And uh, there was myself and I think four other, three other uh, Western stunt people, two from the UK, one from Australia. And again, I think because, because by then I spoke Cantonese and I could say, oh, you know, uh, director you and I worked with you before you know there was a bit more of a trust and then they would insert me into scenes you know to give me more to do so even if I was you'll know the term ND stuntman like a nondescript they would have a bunch of Chinese stunt people and they wanted a west they just say okay you, you can play that part run in and get hit in this big wide shot so that was nice and there was a moment where I was playing a vampire character and I had to like square off with the lead actress and like roar at her and bear my fangs and then attack. And uh, I remember I did it and the rhythm wasn't right. I was going too fast or whatever. And then Korean just said, let me show you. But it wasn't in an aggressive way. And it wasn't like I'm going to show the stupid actor a line reading. He just stepped in front of the camera, did a tone perfect performance as a vampire and said, you got it? Yes. And I just love the fact that there was no sort of barriers because often in the UK, it'll be you, you the, the actors are interfacing through an intermediary, be it a stunt person or a first assistant director. And there's Corey Yoon, who's a legendary action designer, former stuntman, director of many movies. And he just knows the efficient thing to do here is to just show the stunt guy what's required. Yeah. So what does that relationship look like in Hong Kong when you have a director who will just take the camera from the camera operator? Is there ever is there no ego there just as there's no ego in the stunts? If there's if there's ego or not, I can't say, but I think it's just kind of like the way things are. It's a different sense of hierarchy and respect for the action director in Hong Kong than let's say that, that I've then I've seen in say the UK or in Europe. And I've told this story before, but this for me encapsulates sort of let's get the job done. Let's uh, not have hissy fits. Let's not have a, a um, let's not get a bruised ego. Let's just do what's right. And let's respect this person as the filmmaker that they're, they are. I did a movie called Scaremonger. It was a, little very low budget horror comedy and there was a fight sequence and i think i shot like night shoot i probably turned up around seven o'clock in the evening and i shot till about 10 o'clock in the morning uh because the movie was shot in seven days and at a certain point in the morning there was a fight scene to do and it was a very quick fight comedy fight mayuk singh turns up he choreographed something and 
And there was one move where I had to kick uh, Jerry Lamb and I think the camera was reading the kick and his reaction. And I think they did two takes that the camera wasn't getting it. And the DOP for that movie, Choi Song Fai, he uh, did a lot of movies for that director, but he was also a uh, Peter Powell's second unit director. Peter Powell won an Oscar for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. This guy was the second unit DOP on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And we're doing this movie and Mayok Seng says, let me take the shot. We do it in one take. He gives the camera back to Choi Sung Fai, the DOP, and Choi Sung Fai says, you really are a master. That's how a DOP spoke to a stunt coordinator who took the camera off him. <laughs> do you think that maybe there's a, do you think that maybe there's like a, a more, what, what am I trying to ask? I mean, I've seen this too in the U S where look, uh, American films, when you have a good DP, they're the best looking things in the world. Mm. Right? And for that reason, DPs are very, um, they're very protective over their IP, essentially, yes. over their brand. And I imagine it's probably the same in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, much of yes. our, you know, much of our photography comes from there. There's this direct lineage in a sense. Is that sentiment different in Hong Kong? Because there are great DPs in Hong Kong. You worked with one. But is there a, is there a, do they allow the sort of vision of the film to break just slightly so that the action director can get his shot? I have a theory, which actually goes back to when we were talking about England's attitudes towards action. In England, in the UK, our theatrical tradition is Shakespeare. And a lot of our great dramatic actors on screen have come from a theatrical background. And that's what they're respected for. Hong Kong action filmmakers of the era that we appreciate so much come from Chinese opera. Chinese opera is the Shakespeare of the UK in the sense that it's the conduit that led to these great filmmakers. So I think there's less of that snobbery that you get in the UK that, oh, there's a stunt guy telling me what lens to put on the camera because these people have come from the great performing tradition. So there's, when we talk about action director, I think there's greater status or there was greater status in Hong Kong of an action director than say a second unit director in the UK, because I've done second unit shots in the UK where I'm following a previs, a previs that works, a previs that I've shot, that I've edited, that's been signed off by the director, signed off by the producer, and then I'm on set and the second unit DP says, we're crossing the line here, we're jumping the line. And I say, yes, we are. It works in the previs. We can all follow the action. Everybody signed it off. And the reason why the DP doesn't want to cross the line is because they're thinking their boss, the main unit DP, is going to give them flack for jumping the line. And I've, I've experienced that a lot. Whereas in Hong Kong, I think if a camera operator or a DP were to question Samo Hong's authority, they would get an earful, and quite rightly, and they probably wouldn't work again. And instead, you had people like Arthur Wong, a great DP who started in the Shaw Brothers, they know these people aren't just physical people, they are filmmakers. I mean, if you look at the work that Lao Garlung was doing in Return to the 36th Chamber or Invincible Pole Fighter, it's not just about choreography, the camera movement, the edit, he's speed ramping in Return to the 36th Chamber. And this was with celluloid. This was pre-digital, pre-video playback. We often think of Lao Gala and Sifu as being a great Sifu, but he was a Sifu of filmmaking. And I think the DOPs that grew up in that industry understood this. Whereas in the UK, 
even now after many years and, and many projects sometimes you you're arguing you're con- trying to convince a dop that to shoot something a certain way even if you have a previs that works and you say no this is this works you can see it cuts you know i remember doing one movie and um it was a war movie and we needed like a high angle shot, just a quick little insert of somebody getting stomped in the face. And uh, the director, I think it was his first feature film. He'd done television. He hadn't done a lot of action. And I said to him, what we do is we have the foot, the guy doing the stomp a little bit slower. You undercrank the camera to 22 frames per second. And he said, every time I've seen that, it looks like Benny Hill. And what I wanted to say to him is, no, every time you've seen it done badly, it looks like Benny Hill, because most of the times you didn't even know you were watching something under cranked. And that's why I love previs is sometimes to say to people, oh, yeah, by the way, we shot that at 21 frames per second. And more and more, like uh, I just did a series in France and uh, my main uh, director of photography, Steve DeRocco, who's wonderful, he came onto the project having worked as an operator on Marco Polo, having worked uh, second unit for JJ Perry. So he understood what previous was. He understood sometimes I'd want to operate the camera. And what I wanted when I could was when I shot previous was to have Steve with me and to shoot the previous. And sometimes I go, Steve, I'm going to do my take so you can see what I want. And now I want you to replicate it and make it prettier or more have a better aesthetic quality. And then when we're on set, Steve would have sometimes remind me, do you remember when we shot the previous, we actually did this? Ah, oh, yeah. And then we weren't having discussions on set. Is it better to do this at a 90 degree shutter angle? Because we'd already tested it out. When did you start to see the tide turning in the West with that? We're kind of jumping ahead, but we can jump around. I, I don't think the tide has really turned in the UK, if I'm honest with you. So for me, of the, I came back to the UK end of 2004, and I'm going to try and give you the condensed version. But, you know, I came back and I kind of thought, well, I've got eight years of stunt work in Hong Kong, working with some legendary stunt coordinators, some great directors of action. Um, I, I should be able to make a living here as a stunt performer. And I'd also started to do little bits of coordinating. And uh, in the UK, you have uh, the British Stunt Register, which is a register of uh, professional stunt performers. It's evolved quite a bit since when I came back to the UK. It's opened up a bit more. But at the time, they tried very much to be a closed shop. And it was very much about keeping new people out of the industry, or at least that was my perception. And your previous experience in stunts counted for nothing as far as they were concerned, unless you had an in with somebody of influence on the committee. So when I came back to the UK, the the message pretty much was, well, if you want to do stunts, it's lovely that you've got eight years. It's lovely that you've done explosions and falls and fire and ratchets but you need to qualify in six skills. You need to pass a swimming test. You need to do a high diving test. You need to do a horse riding test, blah, blah, blah. And I started to go through that process. And I have to say, just to to pause, I have respect for anybody that does it. And I know people that had worked extensively abroad, came back to the UK and did that whole process. So I've got nothing but respect for them. They're better men than me. I found... It was costing me a fortune. I was getting a lot of injuries training more than doing stunts. And they weren't the kind of injuries where it was a bruise. They were the kind of things like my knee is really not thanking me for doing this. You know, my back is not happy about this. This is not putting me in good stead in terms of my stunt career, let alone my health and middle age. Um, So I found that hard. And also in the back of my head, I was thinking the way the British Stunt Register works Once you qualify, realistically, you're not going to coordinate for 10 years. I'd already started coordinating. And for me, certainly now, my passion is action design. It's being behind the camera. So I reached a point where I was training, but then I started to get work outside of the register. 
sometimes on independent films or music videos or where people just say, we don't care, we want to hire you. And I reached a point where it was like, do you know what? I'm not going for the register. I'm just going to do my own thing. And um, it meant working on a lot of low budget things. It meant working uh, uh, in less than ideal situations sometimes, but it meant that I got to once again, learn my trade and build up experience behind the camera uh, on set. Because some stunt people, not all, look, I have to say, there's a lot of very talented stunt people in the UK, some really good fight choreographers, some very good action designers coming up. But I know stunt people in the UK that make ridiculous amounts of money for doing the minimal. Some of them, I don't think they want to be stunt performers. I think they want the paycheck. But if you say to them, there's no crash mat here, they want extra money. Whereas when I was doing low budget movies, Sometimes I would have to perform and I would say to the, the camera operator, if you show the floor, I won't have a crash mat. If you're not going to show the floor, I'll have a mat. But I would rather go through the window, hit the ground hard and do a nice looking stunt. Because for me, as JJ Perry says, we do it for the juice. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to do good work. It's not all about the paycheck. Yeah. So do you have, uh, do you have, do you understand what's my question here? Like, where does this British stunt is a British stunt register, British stunt yeah. register? Where does um does it come from the old theater days? And that's why there is this sort of training certification process. I think with the British stunt register, what happened in the um like 1960s, there weren't really stunt performers as such. So people from like uh, wrestling backgrounds, boxing backgrounds, maybe circus, military would be uh, sometimes background artist extras who would get a bump up, get an extra bit of money to perform some stunts. I think not unlike how it used to be in old Hollywood. And there were shows like The Avengers, those kind of TV shows. So some of these guys, ex uh, doorman, boxers started to get regular stunt work. And I think they reached a point where they were like, we need to, rather than be extras that get a bit more money, we need to unionize, we need to protect ourselves. And so the stunt register came about by stunt people trying to have a standard and try to protect themselves and have standardized working practices, standardized conditions of pay, which I think are all good, honorable things. It's uh, It was affiliated with equity, which is the performers union. But and this is just my take on it. I think at a certain point, there was a mentality of famine as opposed to feast. Now, I don't always believe in strong binaries, but I think there are a lot of people fall into two ways of thinking. There's not enough to go around. I need to hoard it for myself. That's the famine mentality. And the feast is we should share, we should look after each other. There's enough. And I tried to have that attitude in life. And within the stunt register, I think at a certain point, it was like we will raise the bar higher and higher and higher and make it harder for people to get into this industry. And on the one hand, you could say it is great that not any old person can walk onto a film set and perform hazardous work and put themselves and other people in danger. I agree with that. But also it's a great way of keeping people out of the industry. Because I used to say, if you're going to raise the standards for admission, you should insist that all your existing members train up to those standards. And when you say that, you get like a, a dirty look, you know. So it was a bit of a closed shop mentality. But luckily, uh, at the time, there was uh, the European Union law basically said it was illegal to restrict people from working by virtue of them being a member of a trade body or not like a trade union so that was my little workaround is i would point out to producers yes i'm not on the stunt register but the only thing that really applies is health and safety law and health and safety dictates that only competent people be employed to carry out stunt work and i say look at my work record and you tell me whether i'm competent or not you know, I wasn't going to try and uh, 
coordinate a, a hot air balloon or a parachuting sequence. But if it's putting together a fight or having some be, somebody bounce off a trampoline onto a crash mat, you know, I think I can do that. So that was how I, you know, started to work in the UK. So you're you're working in the UK now. Uh, are you um, are you coordinating it or are you still just doing stunts? I was doing a bit of both. I was performing and I have to say that there were some coordinators that were open minded enough who didn't care that I was whether I was on the register or not. They wanted to hire somebody that they thought could do the job. So I would perform for some coordinators and then I was coordinating. But again, because I wasn't part of the register, I tended to be working in the more independent scene. So low budget football hooligan movies or music videos or TV commercials, that kind of thing. I have to say, I really enjoy doing music videos because with the exception of, let's say, stylized fight sequences, which you never have enough time to do properly, because it's abstract, there's fewer narrative rules with music videos. They can just say, or you can offer up, hey, we could do a shot of this. We could do, we could have somebody bounce off a mini trampoline while we fire a load of debris at them and you shoot it on a phantom camera. It doesn't need context because you're making something more abstract and you're working with directors that aren't trying to emulate a particular filmmaking language. Maybe they're trying to find a new one. So I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the freedom of that. Um, some of the low budget films I enjoyed more than others, but um, generally British low budget genre films, they try to bite off more than they can chew. And as long as the DVD packaging looks enticing, that's more important to them than the quality of the action that ends up on screen. And also during that period of time, I also worked a lot abroad. So I would be living in London, but I think I did like, well, I've done, I think, five projects in Jordan. Some of them were British or American projects that filmed there, but also I've done a couple of Arabic TV series. I think I did two series in Syria. Um, and then nobody really cares wh whether you're part of a, a trade union or, or a stunt register or not. It's whether you can do the job. That's very cool. Um, yeah, what what is it? Uh, are there Jordanian uh, stunt teams um... it's funny there is now but when i first the first time i worked in the middle east was on a tv show in syria and the stunt people there were uh they had come from like a horse riding background and they'd started to get work in arabic tv series which are very sort of horse camel fighting with swords and so they'd gone from being horsemen that had become like local stunt people and some of them started to get work on their own without needing a foreign coordinator over the years um when i went to jordan i did a tv series where the syrian boys came in but then the next time i went out there was for a, a movie it was monsters dark continent which was a iraq war sort of allegory it was a sci-fi film and for that there were no stunt people so uh, I performed some of the little gags myself. You know, I'd be off in the distance getting shot. But then because the budget wasn't huge and they didn't want to fly people in, I used uh, some local uh, former U.S. Marine Corps guys to do some Humvee work. And then I basically did castings. It's something I'll, I do whenever I go to a location where there isn't a pool of stunt people, or even if there is, I will do action assessments. I want to see the people. And... I met a bunch of people from like martial art, like jujitsu backgrounds and Thai boxing backgrounds and gym guys. And they came in and did castings. And obviously they were very rough around the edges, but that movie was probably 12, 13 years ago. Some of those guys now have their own stunt team. So there was no Jordanian stunt performers now, but now they are coordinating and performing shows themselves or if an american show comes to jordan they get work on it because they got a taste for it and they started to learn and they started to do more and they would order harnesses and that kind of thing and it's quite nice to see the progression of some of those guys careers do you think that some of the um the hong kongness um you were sort of paying that forward now to these teams that you were working with i don't i don't know if i 
consciously think about that, but but I I think it's important to pay it forward. And yes, and I think I was shown a lot of patience by stunt people in Hong Kong who could have gone, oh, this this guy, he, he can't do this, he can't do that, he's messing up, blah, 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 you know. Um, so yeah, and, and even to the point that there was a there was a situation not that long ago, I was doing a fight secret sequence. This was on this French series. And there was one stunt guy could not get what I needed right. And when we wrapped, I think at the end of the day, we hadn't got the take. And I'd said to the first assistant, we start tomorrow with this shot. And as I was going home, I thought about that stunt guy and I thought, I do not want him to go home feeling bad because I've been in that situation. <laughs> and I thought it doesn't help him. It will not make him a better stuntman to beat himself up. He can do that without beating himself up. He can reflect on it and improve without feeling that I think he's rubbish and that he's let me down. And actually because of his NG, strangely, it gave me an idea to do something else with the sequence. So I sent him a little message and I said, I don't want you to go home feeling bad. Don't beat yourself up on it. It happens to all of us. And by the way, because I get to do the shot again tomorrow, I'm going to do it differently. Thank you very much. You know, and that for me was just like, because I try and put myself in the other person's shoes. I had a similar situation in India and there was this one stunt guy and he was supposed to be this expert faller and he comes in and he's no good. And, and I, and I, and I ragged on him a little bit because I was tired and jet lagged, you know, the typical yeah. situation. And then at the end of it, I, I went up to him and I was like, listen, um, you need a lot of work. You, they say you're a fall guy. You're not a fall guy. If you want to be a fall guy, watch these movies, learn your falls and all the best to you. And he didn't come back. But then months later, when we do the shoot, he shows up and I was just like, oh boy, here's the fall <laughs> guy. And he totally had improved. And it was that same kind of, now I never worked in Hong Kong. Um, not to the extent that you did, but I feel like I have that same sort of spirit about like hitting the concrete and being people being patient with me. Mm -hmm. And that's just a really important lesson, I think, for coordinators, especially guys like us who, you know, we're coming up and we're starting to direct um, and, you know, remembering what it was like 20 years ago when we were scared, when we were yeah. hurt, and when we went home feeling like we're useless. Nobody likes feeling like that. But I think it's good to have lessons in humility sometimes. Thinking about what you... The only thing that really gets me is if I think a stunt person doesn't try. Or if they make excuses. Like, not give reasons. Because if a stunt person is struggling with something, I want to hear why. And, you know, I've been in that situation with coordinators where they go, oh, no excuses. And it's like, no, I'm just trying to tell you why it's really difficult for me to hit my mark at that certain time. And the smart ones want to know because they want you to, they want to sort out the problem. And hopefully they give you the benefit of the doubt that if you could sort it out on your own, you would, you know? And sometimes I work with, some really good stunt doubles. And if I see them struggling with something, I'll just walk over very quietly and go, hey, what's happening here? And they'll tell me why. And it's just about experience and trying to be patient with people. But if a stunt person gives me an excuse, and I know it's an excuse, I, I don't want to hear that. And I, I remember on one job, this guy had to do a reaction and he was doing it great when the mat was there. And we took the mat away. It was, oh, the floor's too slippery. Oh, it's this or too that. And one of the stunt guys just turned to him and said, don't say that, you're just bottling it. And, you know, I think it's possible to have a happy medium where you can be strict, you can be focused, you can have high demand, but just not be a complete sociopath, you know. I remember talking to a stunt guy who was former Samo Hong team and uh, he was talking about a, a stunt coordinator that he would not work with because he did not like this person. And he did not like the way this coordinator talked to people. And I said, but you're from Samo's team. Didn't Samo can chew you out pretty hard. And he said, Samo will chew you out when you're not doing your job. And I think that's the difference.
Yeah. So if you're trying, if you're trying, you're going to be in his good graces at least, right? Yeah. I think I saw some an interview with uh, Bobby Samuels where he he talked about Samo not getting mad at him because he did not give up. Mm. He could see, okay, this guy's trying. He's giving his everything, you know. Did you work with Samo on the medallion? I worked with Samo Hong on knockoff and the medallion. Um, I wouldn't say I worked super close with him. I was just one of many stunt actors. Um, but for me, it was a huge thrill because he is my favorite action coordinator, action director. I mean, for the more fantastic stuff, the wire things, the trampoline things, it's Tony Cheng Su Dong. But for fighting, for me, Samo is pretty much untouchable. And, um, you know, I look at his work from the 80s and 90s, some of the 70s things like Warriors 2, of course, I love. But I think he really found his his confidence and he blossomed in the 80s and 90s. And then it was not just choreography, it was camera movement, it was editing. And the thing that I try to carry into my work, uh, inspired by Samo, look, I don't believe... 98% of movie fighting or movie fighting is, is not realistic. And I always shudder when I hear a director or a producer say, I want it to be realistic because most of the time they don't. And they're just portraying the fact that they don't know what a fight looks like or what it's like to be in a fight. But for me, what I try to do is within the world of that TV show or movie, within all the parameters of that world that you've created and those characters, I want it to feel like a fight. So even if it's two women fighting with swords and it's very beautiful and quite balletic, I still want it to feel to the audience like somebody's trying to kill the other person. And I think Samo was the master of that, that you, prodigal son, that's not realistic. Nobody fights like that. It's beautiful Wing Chun technique and other Kung Fu technique, but it feels like a fight. And then... You know, Dragons Forever, Pedicab Driver, you, you feel like a, there's a fight going on. And, and for me, that's important is I want to put that in my work, whether it's fantasy, superhero, Indian movie, it doesn't matter. I want it to feel like a fight. You, um, because I've, I've looked at some of the work that you, that you've done that has a very sort of, um, I mean, you shoot montage style, you, you use camera as part of the choreography. This is all like trademark, the whole, all the whole gamut of those guys did that, but especially Samo and Corey Yoon. Um, Samo was doing some really interesting stuff in the late eighties, like with Pedicab Driver, where the editing was rapid fire. It's faster than Born Identity editing. Um, did you ever, I, and then, and then he switched back. He kind of did this like slower paced editing in the early nineties. Um, any idea why his style shifted? I don't know why his style shifted, but I think Samo as a filmmaker was evolving and wanting to do different things. And I think most filmmakers, it's like, it's like the thing Bruce Lee said, you know, water has to keep flowing or it grows stagnant. And I'm not, I don't want to name names and I don't want to speak bad of, other filmmakers but we can probably all think of particularly directors that reached a certain point and then they just kind of got stuck in a rut of repeating themselves whereas there are other directors that revisit the same themes or the same stories but with a different language of telling that story and it still feels refreshing so maybe Samuel was just trying to try different things I mean when I look at the thing that I find about Samo's work in the 80s, particularly like Heart of the Dragon and up until the early 90s, he would use dollies and quite long lenses to capture the action, which is so difficult. And I don't know how he does it. And I know whenever I've had to do something similar, like a tracking shot, we never have enough time to master it. You know, like I mean, master it in the sense of get it that precise and you know, on the, the series I was doing recently, I, I needed to do a movement uh, where the camera was moving and following, you know, three people fighting. And I just knew I didn't have the time. So I sat on the dolly, but I handheld the camera on a fig rig. And because we were shooting at, I think, 6K or 8K, 
I, I gave myself lots of real estate so that I could repo the shot in post and make it feel more precise. But when you think about Heart of the Dragon, I don't think they even had a video assist. You know, they probably had to wait until the next day to make sure that the focus had been nailed. It's so impressive. But I do sometimes, sometimes I use Samo's work as an example. I mean, I have a thing of, I like to post clips that inspire me on social media, on Instagram or on Facebook. And sometimes I will post like a 10 second clip from a Samo Hong film. I mean, there was Skinny Tiger, Fatty Dragon, which he didn't direct. Of course, Lao Garwing did it, but Samo, I'm sure, had input and Ridley Choi was there choreographing. There was like 10 seconds and there was something like eight cuts within the 10 seconds. And I commented like, don't talk about fast cuts, meaning action is impossible to follow. And the difference was every shot was motivated. Every shot was specific. It told a story. Whereas we all know the Taken 3 or whatever, it was Taken 2, where it's just like, let's put a bunch of cameras on it, shoot a load of masters at different speeds, and then let it to cut something together that's exciting. I remember watching one of those fights uh, in one of the Taken sequels, and I was kind of slowing it down because I'm a nerd and I want to analyze. And there was actually some really clever, nice choreography. The, the fight team had actually told a story. They hadn't just done a bunch of moves. And I thought, this is not doing justice to the fights. Yeah. Um, when I worked on Kingsman, I remember uh, there was a moment, it, it was in the tunnels at the end. And everything had been pre And this is something that I do now often is you print frames from the pre on a big board and you have it on the board. So you cross it off as you go. So everyone understands. Um, and there was a shot where somebody was firing with a, a rifle and they let go and it's on its sling and he takes his hand down to his side arm and pulls it up. And camera operator wasn't quite getting it. And Brad said to him no no the story of this shot is him going from his rifle to his sidearm and i thought that's exactly it this shot which lasts all of one two seconds tells a story it's motivated and samo certainly does that gareth evans certainly does that and that's what i try to do is even though i may never reach the levels of the brad allens or the gareth evans or the samo hongs is Try to make the shots tell a story and be motivated, not just be a load of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like uh, Brad Allen was, you know, another one of those guys who, as an action designer, he made filmmaking part and parcel to the whole process. So um, how have you now uh, utilized filmmaking and integrated that with your action design? Well, since my teenage years, I've always been interested in videos and videography and editing. And, you know, I would watch Eastern Condors on VHS and go through it frame by frame and see how it cut. And I would notice things like, you know, when you cut from the wide to the medium, you don't just do a hard cut on that edit point. You go back a few frames so the audience has a chance to reorientate themselves. I noticed sometimes that there would be a one frame cross frame, like a dissolve between two shots. And that's a trick that I use. If the, if there's a little blip in continuity in terms of body movements, if I'm cutting from one frame, one shot to another shot, I'll just have one frame where it's a uh, like a 50% opacity. And sometimes that gets you across a lot of things. So I've always loved movies. You know, I loved movies before I loved martial arts, before I loved action. I've loved image, photography. And when I came to the UK, I was really shocked at how backward things were because not just on action movies, but like I would be brought in to fight coordinator a sequence and they would shoot the whole sequence, the dialogue into the little fight as a master. And then again and again and again. And I was like, what? This is not how you do it. You're going to tire out the actors. 
there's much more chance of injury if you perform the whole fight in one go and they're performing the whole fight five times and none of its specifics so it doesn't look very good it just seemed totally backward and i remember when i got approached to work on blood the last vampire uh, Mike Leader, the casting director, said, uh, oh, Jude, uh, it might not be the kind of money you're used to doing stunts in the UK, and you can beat this. I said, after a couple of years in the UK, it would be nice to work with someone who knows what the f*** they're doing. You know, and I was on set with Corey Yoon, and it was like, yeah, <laughs> I didn't dream it. <laughs> this is how you shoot action <laughs> in stages specifically, and you make sure you catch the moment and you tell the story. Um and then when I started to coordinate and work on lower budget movies or independent movies, even if I wasn't like the credited action director, I would try to develop a dialogue with the DOP and with the director and say, if we do it this way, this will work, this won't work, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you meet a lot of resistance because nothing other than ego and insecurity. But then other times people would welcome it because ultimately if it looks good they look good as a director in the same way that i don't need to choreograph everything that i action design now because if somebody on my stunt team can give me an awesome bit of choreography using movements that i didn't know it excites me as an audience member but also I, it makes for a better sequence and that's my job so the filmmaking for me uh, choreography performance is at most 50% of, a, of an effective action sequence, particularly fight sequences and particularly stylized fight sequences. The camera and the editing is at least equally important. And I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, you know this, but that lesson needs to be told. So I worked on this movie called Final Score uh, as the assistant stunt coordinator. And part of my duties was a lot of the choreography. And we had a fairly decent prep for an action movie with an okay budget. It wasn't Marvel, it wasn't Warner Brothers, but it had a budget. And there was going to be a fight in an elevator with Dave Batista and a bad guy. And there's a third person in the elevator who's like a wimp. And um, I started to choreograph it with Chris Webb, my best friend from the video game years ago. And I said to Chris, okay, there's three guys in an elevator. Let's have an elevator that's the actual size of the elevators in this location. Let's not cheat and build a massive one. And I said, we both know that we could make this very cutty and hide the gun. But let's make this fight the story of the gun in the sense that even if the camera doesn't see it, there's a reason, there's a logic to this that the three guys, one gun, your priority is going to be to try and take control of that gun. Let's tell a story with this fight. So Chris and I worked on this fight and the stunt coordinator would come in and he gave some good suggestions as well. And then down the line, Rob DeGroot, Dave Batista's stunt double, he got involved and Dave did, but not in a controlling way, just enhancing everything. But it was about, let's tell the story of this fight. Let's make it believable. And we worked on it. Dave was very happy with it. And then when we shot it, I think we shot it in one night. It's an okay fight. I'm happy with it. But I'm sure if it had been shot in specific shots telling a story, it could have been just that much more fun for the audience, you know? And that was one of the things that actually made me go, I need to push to be the action director on jobs and not just think, I'm going to be given control because on final score, there was one time the, the film shut down for a little bit because Dave had to go away. And when he came back, we had to do some pickup shots of one of the fights and they brought in a second unit director. Yes, he was a second unit director. He wasn't an action guy. And he had to just pick up a few shots of this fight and he didn't want to hear from us about what we thought it needed to be done. And I remember thinking, hang on a minute. We've lived with this fight for months. We've workshopped it. We know the story. And it was like, I, it was, and that just made me feel, oh, that's bad. So then when 
if it's a movie that just is explosions and warfare, I don't need to be the action director. If they want it, great. But if people want stylized fight sequences, I'm at a point now in my career where I will tell them what it requires. And if I don't get the job, it's okay. There'll be something else. But I will say, you need someone who knows what you're doing, they're doing. This lives and dies by its camera work and by its editing. We need to pre-visit. We need to have a Q-take system on set. Do you know Q-take? It's where the footage from the camera basically gets captured and sent to your laptop. So most of the time these days, if I'm second unit directing, I've got the previous on a timeline in Premiere and I'm just replacing shots from the camera over the previous and it becomes basically like a paint by numbers where you're replacing. And that way, if you have to shoot out of sequence because of we need to do two shots with the crane or the lighting turnaround is going to be too much. You've got, you know that it's cutting together because you're shooting so specifically and you're editing with your previous. And then when I'm done with editing the Q take, I will get the high resolution rushes a couple of days later and I'll refine the edit. And then that's what I send to the editors, not just my video, but I will send them a something they can ingest into their avid or their final cut and match frame by frame what I've did. Because let's say I'm shooting in 6K and it's a widescreen movie, but we've shot it full frame. I'm repoing the shot in post to follow the action or maybe to hide something that doesn't look too good or I'm zooming in 15%. And I want an editor to have my edit as a starting block. Then if there are changes to be made on by because the producer wants it or the director, that's their choice. I have to let it go at that point. I don't own these things. They're not my sequences. They're just sequences. But previs, editing on set, and then editing after the fact and sharing that is, I think it's integral. And some directors I work with fully support that. Xavier Jeans, a French director, I first worked with him on Gangs of London. Then we worked together on Havoc, and then we did this movie Farang in Thailand. He basically had to tell the French producers, Jude's going to come in. You're not used to how he works, but this is how he works. He does a previous. He's gonna, we're going to follow the previous. And then, sure enough, the editor basically replicated my edit, I would say, maybe 95% to the cut. And it was it was essential because we did one fight in an elevator with a lot of blood and guts and prosthetics and hidden cuts. And it was like, if you don't follow the exact repos that I've done, you know, zooming in and zooming out, these hidden cuts aren't going to work. So is that the same process you followed when um, working with, I mean, is that the process that Gareth? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, with Gareth, he doesn't need me to, to shoot or edit it because that's what he does and he's a master of it. But essentially I would say, if I'm directing action, the the process I follow in terms of previous and edit is very heavily based on what I learned working with Brad Allen and working with Gareth. And I picked up so much working with Gareth uh, in terms of um, not just narrative, because I learned a lot about how to tell a story in a fight and explaining the importance of establishing geography. And sometimes at the end of a fight, re-establishing the geography so the audience is orientated so i learned storytelling things from gareth and i still do but in terms of the technical about what you can get away with if you punch in 20 percent on an 8k image or using the top and bottom portions of the screen hiding cuts with whips and and, and that sort of thing and um the thing is it works that that's the the thing i find i understand productions being resistant to it because of the cost implications because hiring a stunt team for a week to pre a fight and then taking two days to shoot the fight and having to hire a Q-take operator in some people's mind it's like hey but we've done tv shows where the stunt team turned up in the morning and then in the afternoon they shot the fight <laughs> you know but you and I know the results aren't the same but when people say they want to do high level action and then they don't want to take those steps and they prefer to shoot a bunch of masters and figure it out in the edit afterwards i, I don't get it i really don't get it and just as an example I, I don't want to cite examples of things that are bad 
But if you look at the first season of Iron Fist and you look at the TV series Warrior, you wouldn't believe it was the same action designer. You know, Brett Chan is one of the best guys doing action in series. But on Iron Fist, he wasn't able to do his thing. He's proved what he can do now. You know? Yeah, I, I guess, uh, is that something that, because everybody, everybody and their mother says, I want action like the raid. Yeah. Everybody says that. And uh, and I'll, I'll say this. I'm not blowing smoke, but I'll say, yeah, but have you seen Gangs of London? I always say this because, because the Gangs of London action sort of ratchets up the danger an extra notch. Um, but then when you have when you have a calling card like Gangs of London and people say, I want action like this, then you can do you find that you can now say, OK, if you want that, there's a process attached to that. Yeah. And without that process, you don't get that. And how do you translate that to them? Because they're going to see it like they're going to see it like the old school people see it where it's like well we just need action our dp is going to shoot and edit it out and it's kind of just like it's just a churn for them how do you appeal to their sentiments here i think it really depends gangs of london certainly changed my career in terms of i don't want to say it showed people what i can do because it was totally a collaboration i had a genius director who was also editing the action sequences i had a great dop stunt team special effects um armorers you know so it was very much a, a team process but as a showreel piece it certainly changed the course of my career and i started getting lots of approaches from bigger productions and instead of having to knock on doors i was getting knocks on the doors that's kind of given me the confidence that okay there's a there's going to be work for the next couple of years unless something really goes bad so if i get approached i'm going to tell people what it takes and if they don't want to do that and they want to go with someone else, that's totally okay. Because for me, I'm speaking very personally now. I'm not super ambitious in that I don't need to be working on the biggest movie. I don't need to be working with the biggest budgets and the biggest actors. If anything, my experience on some of the bigger movies has made me know that's not the environment I want to work in. I want to be artistically challenged. I want to do work that the end result I don't have to make excuses for, although sometimes I will, of course. And I want to work with people that I like working with. I want to work with positive people and friendly people and creative people who are, who are creatively invested, who get behind you. This series I just did in France, I knew that the camera team liked what we were doing on second unit. It wasn't like something they'd done before. And they cared. And they, I think they could see that I cared. It wasn't sausage factory action filmmaking, you know. And I want to work with people like that. So Farang, for instance, I just worked on this big Netflix movie with some big actors. And my agent got called. And there was a show that was being produced by Disney that were interested in me doing the action. And I said to my agent, no, I'm going to. Maybe we'll do that show, maybe. But the next project for me is Farang because I want to work with Xavier and I want to do this job in Thailand. And luckily I have an agent that supports me and he understands the way I think. And it's like Xavier Jones is a great filmmaker who loves cinema. And in addition to that, he's a friend. He makes me laugh. And also he supports me to do what I do. And we have that kind of ego-free thing that I can present some choreography to him that I think is pretty good and works. And if he gives me a note, I know it hasn't come from a position of ego or needing to assert his authority. It's come from a position of how he needs to tell his story. And he's always right. And otherwise he leaves it alone. You know, so there are some things where the previous and the finished sequence, nothing changed because... I was telling the story that he wanted, or I was hitting the character beats that he wanted. Xavier and I can sit on set on main unit together and I lead the action sequence and he has my back and he's giving notes to the actors about the emotional performance. Or he's going, one time he said, 
no, 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 Jude, the reason why you did that shot was because you were trying to tell the story of what that guy's doing with his foot. Because I was in the thick of the fog of war. I was just doing the shot. And he was like, no, 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 the reason, you know, the story of the shot is this. He was telling me what the story of my shot was. He was right. And then he can also leave me alone on second unit to finish off the fight. And I can send him videos and he can say, yes, I love it. Move on. Or, oh, Xavier, I tried this. What do you think? That's the kind of people I want to work with if I can you know um and there was a time maybe a couple of years ago i I used to kind of play down like what what we do for a living oh it's not it's not saving babies it's not curing cancer of course it's not maybe what we do is not important in the great scheme of things but it's what i do and it's the only thing i know how to do so i'm going to try and do it And if it means taking a lesser paycheck or digging my heels in during pre-production or during a meeting and risk losing a job, I'll do it because I want to do good action. And I want to work with good people that share that kind of vision. So you're doing Farang or Farang. Farang, yeah. Uh, There's an action, there's a vision to the mm. action and I could see it. In fact, it's a, it's also an elevator fight uh, with a pistol. <laughs> Is this a response to the one with Batista? Not at all. It was, it was, uh, Xavier talked to me about Ferrang probably 18 months before we ended up shooting it. Cause there was the pandemic and so on. And he, he just said, Oh, we've got a, we've got a fight in an elevator. And uh, the thing that needs to happen is that the a character needs a certain character needs to get his arm broken and the arm and the bone sticks out. Those were his parameters. And he said, uh, I know there's been some other fights in, in elevators, or there's there's one in Die Hard 3, but really I, I don't want to tell you too much. So then I started when I started designing, and we were still during COVID. Uh so Xavier was in Thailand. Uh, or maybe he was in France, but he wasn't able to come to the UK to be with us. So I was literally for that fight, because it was one that needed to tell a story. I said to my team, I had uh, two stunt guys from Germany. I had Chris Webb and then I had uh, Shane Stein. I said, guys, we're not going to shoot a previous yet. We're going to shoot a blocking on the phone, very slow motion where we just tell the story of all the beats. We'll send it to Xavier and he can give us some notes. And then Xavier came back. I love this. I love that. And that seems a bit convenient. That happens almost twice. It feels like a double beat. So he gave us very specific, legitimate notes. We refined it, sent him another blocking. Yes. And then it was just crack on with the previous. And I think ultimately, again, because of COVID, I ended up doing the proper previous in Bangkok. But we followed that shot for shot. There were no refinements after that. And the gun was just something where I was like, wow, this is going to be much more interesting if there's a gun. Yeah, yeah it, it was. And what I, I, what I love is the feeling of danger in that. Is that something that you are, um, that you're gravitating towards increasing I, danger? It, it's that thing about, I, I like to feel that it's a fight. And a very easy way to do it is have something like a, a, a gun to focus on that automatically everyone can relate to the fact that that needs to be your priority. Working with Gareth, the first time I worked with Gareth was on Apostle. And, you know, I got contacted, oh, Gareth Evans is making a film in the UK. You know, he's interested in working with you. And I was like, oh, my God. And straight away, I'm excited. But then the imposter syndrome comes up and you're like i'm not good enough to to do action for the guy who did the raid you know and and i didn't know what a lovely collaborative human gareth is he could be a maniac control freak you know but again it's that thing about trying to stay true to what we do and respecting what we do it's not a religion but it's like if you set yourself certain goals or standards and follow that you kind of stay on a good path and in apostle one of the sequences there's a scene with a like a torturing mangle machine where the lead character is like strapped to a table and he's got hooks running through his hands and 
with what counterweights and cogs and Gareth was going, guys, it's not really a fight scene. There's a bit of fighting, but this is the sequence. And I just want to work it out uh, during a previous because the bad guy has to die and the hero has to escape. And I think I'd only been working with Gareth for like two or three days. I said, Gareth, I need to understand how this machine works. And he was like, oh, don't worry about it. It looks cool. You know, anything. Can... I said, no, we as a team need to understand how it works. Maybe the audience ultimately doesn't need to understand how every lever works. But if we don't follow and respect the rules, the audience is going to pick up on it. And in my gut, I was thinking, I'm probably going to get a phone call tonight. <laughs> you can go back to London, leave Wales, you know. And the next day, Gareth came back and he'd done his sketches. And he was like, OK, when this lever gets pulled, that weight drops down. And da -da 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 -da. He, made a he made him make a torture device at home. Nice job. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 the thing about Gareth is he he loves the fact that when we do action design, there is no hierarchy. I mean, of course, he's my boss and that I'm the boss of the stunt people, but we don't talk like that. Every idea is open for interrogation. Every idea we try to shoot down. If one of my stunt performers has a suggestion, it gets equal airtime than if I say it or Gareth says it. And we interrogate it and we just try and make the best sequence possible. And it's that level of interrogation, I think, Again, it's something that you receive, a lot of audiences won't receive on a conscious level. It's like people who don't understand action, when they watch Kingsman, they know they're watching something different compared to a lot of the other fight scenes that year. Where if people watch Gangs of London, it's not just the fight sequence are, long, are longer and are more violent that makes it better than some other TV shows. And it's because we've interrogated the ideas. We've challenged them and we try to tell a story and, and and to be honest with you previs uh action design is my favorite part of the process and when i'm second unit directing or action directing for most directors i want to be in control but i love being with gareth because he takes charge of the camera he takes charge of the edit and he shoots things 50 percent. his instincts are where mine are and then the other time he does something that I wouldn't have thought of. And it's exciting because you don't want to see the same old stuff. You know, it, does he uh, does he take part in the previous process, too? And did he do that? Oh, no, he's process? totally across it. That's it. So if you see Gangs of London, we had, I think, 12 weeks of pre-production action design. And myself and my team will tend to do the bulk of the actual physical choreography in terms of the movement and the techniques. But there will be ideas that Gareth had percolating in his head that he wants involved, and we will try and incorporate those. But then in terms of how it's shot, most of the time, 90% of the time, it's Gareth leading it, editing it, Gareth leading it. But we have that kind of relationship where I can say, do you mind if I just, while you're editing that, can I try a different angle or a different move? Uh, and and he's not precious. And if it works, he uses it. And if it doesn't work, he doesn't. He doesn't have to make me feel better. It's all about the sequence. As you're designing action now, do you find yourself? Because um... you talked about Beat Takeshi earlier, yeah, and Sonatine, and those are some of my favorite movies too. Um, and the simplicity of his action scenes, also. Yeah. Um, in fact, they're like bare bottom minimalist Ozu. Like if Ozu made action movies, right? It'd be yeah. Takeshi Kitano movie. Um, do you take inspiration from his films today? And yes. what do you what do you draw from them? Well, I think there's a couple of things. As you know, you can have the most ambition in the world, but if you don't have the time to shoot it, you're just gonna have to compromise on set. So I would rather plan for the shoot day and for me the kitano way of action sometimes is the most economical both in terms of storytelling but also in terms of they didn't have a lot of time so sometimes it can be like in sonatine when he goes into the room at the end with the machine gun 
you have the outside of a building and the flashing light and you cut to him firing his machine gun and then you cut to some people reacting and it's brilliant and it's perfect. So it's that ec economy of storytelling and, and filmmaking, which I take, but also I think more than that is, and I've become more aware of it. I love the humor in Katano's films, even films and moments that should be very serious, which are very life and death, where there's jeopardy, there's humor, there's absurdity. And I I think when I was younger, I took myself too seriously. Um, uh, but now I'm older, I'm, I, I, I think life is ridiculous. I laugh at myself. When, when I'm working with people that I love, we take the piss out of each other all the time. And it's just like, Life is absurd, and I think it's important to find humor in all situations, even the most difficult situations. You know, grief, you can find humor in it. Loss, trauma, there's all opportunities for humor. It's how you choose to look at it. And I guess from some of us, it's a coping mechanism. But I like to put humor in my action. And sometimes it's very deliberately obviously i'm trying to be funny you know somebody gets kicked in the balls or whatever but also sometimes it's a more dark and twisted humor so like i don't know if you remember in gangs of london the 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 end of the in england it was the first episode i think it was the second in the states where uh Chope is fighting the big naked guy in shorts with the meat cleaver and when we were choreographing it uh the mission impossible i can't remember which one it was the the mission impossible fight in the bathroom was getting a lot of praise and, and it's, it's a good fight i'm not not ragging on the fight but there was a bit where liang yang reaches under a wash basin and pulls out a bit of piping and uses it as a weapon and it's cool because it's mission impossible and it's a fun fight and i thought yeah yeah that's really convenient and i was like gareth what if Len's walking towards Elliot and Elliot looks towards some pipes in the wall and he goes for those pipes and we think, oh, it's going to be copper pipe versus meat cleaver and the pipes don't give. And then Gareth was like, yeah. And, and then when Gareth shot the previous, because I think Gareth is a master of tension about rhythms, he really milked it. He really like telegraphs it. So we go from a profile of Elliot, we pull focus to the pipe. Then he sees the pipe. And he tugs on it. And it was, I think it was Gareth that said something like, but I want him to pull on it three times. And I'm like, why? And if you remember in um, Police Story 2, when Jackie Chan's being pursued by those guys down the alleyway and he walks up to a drain pipe and he yanks on it and it doesn't get... <laughs> so that was our nerdy thing. But yeah, for me, it was the humor. It was like, let's put the, the character in a difficult situation and, and, and really up the stakes. And so, so yeah, I like, I like to do that. In in one of Xavier's episodes of Gangs of London, we have a fight in a hotel room, and I guess it was a bit of the beat to Kashi. We only had eight hours or nine hours to shoot this fight, and it was on a very small splinter unit. I was I was directing, and I said, oh, I want to just cut out into the corridor and just see the blade burst through the door, and then it cuts square onto the door and you see the blade burst through a couple of more times and we just have a little, I think we have a little do not disturb sign, you know, hanging on the door. So I like to put humor uh, in action because I think it's important to find humor where you can. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, do you think that, um, like, do you find that when you offer funny ideas, obviously Gareth is very receptive. Have you found in the past that, um, there's resistance because maybe people think that a, a dark situation, you shouldn't have humor. It, it, of course. And sometimes they'll be right. You know, I, I ideally, I want to have the kind of relationship with a director where we can have those conversations, but it's open. And sometimes the director will be correct because they have an overarching vision of the whole story. And it, it might be a 90 minute movie or it might be an eight episode series. And I have to trust them that if they go, oh, that's a bit much or that's a bit camp or that's a bit ridiculous or slapstick, I go, okay. But 
once upon a time, you know, I would have to sort of tiptoe around directors with suggestions. And now I kind of, I'll say to them, listen, I'm going to give you loads of ideas. I'm going to give you loads of suggestions and you can knock them away, but knock them away for the right reason. Yeah. You know, yes, I, mean, I mean, yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's just, it's, I just kind of reached a point now where if if I'm not going to gel with somebody like creatively, I'd rather step away before we get into it yeah. in in a friendly, nice way, you know? Where where do you think that comes from with yourself? This um you're seeking out well, you, you know, it, there's one thing to be looking for humor all the time, but then it's another thing to just find the humor and be open and receptive to it, right? Kind of like a non-reactive way of sort of seeing things. Um have you always been like that? No, no, I, I used to, I used to take myself too seriously, you know, and I think it probably came, it probably came from all kinds of things, you know, like deep back in, in childhood, and you know, being sent to boarding school. I don't want to psychoanalyze myself here, but, you know, when I went to Hong Kong, I, you know, I was young and not really that good a screen fighter and not working that much to start with. And it's very easy to be insecure about yourself. And now it's just reached a point where it's like, yeah, I'm ridiculous. You're ridiculous. We're all ridiculous and it's okay. And life, life is much more pleasant if you just have like a paradigm shift of how you view things, you know? And a lot of people I found on movie sets, particularly in the UK, stunt people, action people, they can sometimes take themselves very seriously and be very macho. I don't think that's conducive, one, to a happy work environment. And I think it's important that if you're going to go to set for 10, 12 hours a day for months on end, it's important you be happy. It's not good enough that you create good work. I think it's, for me, it was actually like a conscious choice of like, have fun, be humble. When you make a mistake, put your hand up to it. I've seen too many times people point the finger when they messed up. And I remember I remember one time I was working on the previous as a performer for Wonder Woman back when Brad Allen was involved. And Ryan Watson was there assisting Guillermo Grispo. I didn't know Ryan well. And it was the first couple of days and something didn't work on a shot in the previous. And Ryan just went, hey, that was my fault. That was my bad. Sorry. And I went, oh, I like this guy because that was kind of unusual on that sort of environment. And I thought, okay, I like this guy because he's not afraid to say he messed up and to own it. And I think once you, if you can liberate yourself from that sort of insecurity about what are the consequences going to be, life just gets much easier. And also a lot of people around you will respond to that and feel comfortable. Mm. You know, for me, the work environment is important. Do you have any disciplines that you follow that help you avoid taking yourself too seriously? I have good friends who can take the mickey out of me. And that certainly extends to work. So Chris Webb, Gareth, when we work together, with our t we're brutal with each other. If you were a stranger coming to a room, you'd be like, who are these people? Because we just, we we strip each other down all the time. But it's coming from a place of familiarity, acceptance, and love. And it's not something I think we consciously do. It's just, that's just the best way to be, you know. On the, the French series I just did, I had three German stunt performers come and help me with action design for a few weeks. And not only are they brilliant stunt performers, um, Hannes Pasta, Raja, Claudia Ploy Hines, great stunt performers with good ideas who can tell me if they think my idea is not good or they'll interrogate my idea. And when I go, well, actually, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. But also we keep each other feet on the ground. And I think it's important, you know, because also in this industry, there's a lot of fakery People who want things will try and blow smoke. And it's important to not believe your own hype, you know? And if I don't have my friends around me, I just have to look at a 1980s Hong Kong movie to remind me that I'm actually not that good. You know, I just have to look at like two minutes of hard boiled and I'm like, 
yeah, that was 30 years ago and it still hasn't been topped. Yeah, I mean, it's like a sculptor looking at, you know, at uh, Michelangelo's work. It's it's like anybody. And you realize that you're not perfect. You're mm -hmm. not the greatest in the world. Uh, you are you and you have an, an angle. Uh, but I think that that context is, uh, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, well, Jude, this has been a, a pleasure. Uh, it's been a pleasure finally talking to you and uh, and thank you for uh, sharing your experiences and your uh, insights. Look forward to seeing your work. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for me too. Action Talks is available on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify. Join my telegram at t.me slash Eric Jacobus. You can check out my studio at superalloyinteractive.com. My website and blog is at ericjacobus.com. And be sure to subscribe. Thank you.